All right, hello and welcome to Overtime Inferno, the uh, your weekly podcast is faster than the roller coaster that is IHC. I'm your host this week, AZS, and with me I have a pair of special guests in New Meet and Tea Time. Introduce yourself, gentlemen. Do you want to go first, uh, I guess. I guess if I'm introduced first, I'll have to go first then. Um, yeah, my name's Yuzi, Yumi. Um, don't even know my own alias clearly um and <laughs> Eugene. i've been i've been casting cs and doing sort of analysis for the game for about four and a bit years coming up on five now which is kind of crazy to think about i don't even remember i remember those first days being quite i was so naive back then so innocent um but yeah i have aged with cs and i'm i'm happy to happy to be on all right uh, and on my side I am Tea Time. I'm not going to say my name is Tea Time because, you know, that's just not it's a thing. An alias. It is an alias. That's true. Um, I've been commentating CS for about seven years now. So when Michael's like, oh, wow, I'm becoming really introspective about my half deck. And I'm just like, okay, Michael, <laughs> fuck off. But um, <laughs> but yeah, so obviously Yumi is Michael because I don't know how many people are like on podcasts or I don't exactly know. Um, and then, you know, before that, I did some Dota before I was cancelled from that. And uh, yeah, now my only association with Dota is like I lose rank at night. And, yeah, which uh, I think you, yeah, I think is uh, what you were just doing, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, we won because Michael yeah, played with won, us on the first yeah. time ever. We actually won. So yeah. <laughs> oh, there you go. I, my knowledge of Dota is limited entirely. So I've I've watched a couple of events that I've worked on, and I I can figure out what the heroes do by comparing them to League of Legends characters who I've seen. Uh, I see. And I'm like, oh, well, that's where League of Legends stole the so, idea. So from. what you're telling me is that Dota, Dota lets you work in the industry, but not me? What the fuck, bro? <laughs> Although I'm, I'm clearly uncancelable. I don't know how to tell you. You've got you've got some good takes as well. So, I mean, you know, you yeah, show a line sometimes. I think that's the problem. I, I, I haven't got any insane takes yet on Dota. Mm. So I, I, I'm not, I don't feel confident enough to, um, you know, to make this. I'm not quite at the, uh, the, the peak of the Dunning-Kruger effect just yet. All you have to just do is call out like some previous DI winner like I did and you're good to go. Oh, yeah. No, that seems like a great idea. That's, that's yeah. No, I'm, I'm going to stay away from doing that. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, we decided to bring these two on because, uh, as some of you probably know, uh, IHC have been the the like the standout story um, at Katowice. They almost usurped like complexity today, but that won't, uh, you know, that won't. Went to Rye quite quickly, um, and we felt we we you know we'd wanted to get somebody on to talk about Asian Counter Strike before, and we thought, what better time to do it than straight after IHC, um, and yeah, I mean the fact that they went they they finally got these big international wins. They, they obviously beat I think it was Zero Zero Nation Rio, um, but they got some big international wins against genuinely good teams, um, in Cloud Nine and Furia, and. They did it with a stand-in as well, which is, which is amazing. Um, I, I, was this something that you think was you could have seen coming, or was this a surprise even to people who'd watched them a bit more regularly? And um, I, I don't know if you want to be the first to jump in here, Titan. Uh, let's, let's, think... let's just make it so you go first, I go second. Generally, speak. sure. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes that, that'll simplify things. Um, yes, it did come as a surprise because. In spite of the fact that they have been the Asia representative twice now for for both of the events, uh, both of the majors of 2022, they were they struggled to get their stars to actually have production on international stages. Like they they qualified for these opportunities, they were obviously doing better than than some of their the regional opposition in terms of making the qualifying brackets, but. In particular, score and annihilation. I wasn't sure that they would ever really get the same level of production that they do in Asia. Sometimes I'd even think score's production uh, domestically has gone down. Weirdly enough, in in spite of the fact that at this event he seemed to almost skyrocket for them. So it's it's a strange place to be. Um, we we got to sort of cast I think one of the first few games this year where I'd see we're using Bartak, and I don't think we we had fully clocked onto the fact that Cabal had had a kid over christmas and we were like why why is cabal not here bartak he's you know he's coming in and he, he he didn't seem like he was the most mechanically sharp but it's it's weird that his 
the decision making and like the fearlessness has basically carried over to Katowice, which is, uh, yeah, I don't think anybody that even watches IG domestically would have expected a result like this because expectations expectations are low. You know, get get one steal or of a win, one upset, and that's about as much as you can ask for. You know, we're we're singing singing cheers and crying our eyes out maybe the fact that there is a chance for Asia Counter-Strike to come back onto the map. Um, a slight disclaimer, I'm more of a romantic about Asian Counter-Strike than Michael is for sure because, uh, <laughs> you know, I do have some time competing uh, through other teams in the region and whatnot. So uh, definitely much more romantic. I was personally not that surprised by the um, upset over Fury, I'll be honest, because I do think that you know, sure, there's all the caveats. Did I expect it to be likely? No, not at all. But I, I did think there was actually a pretty solid chance of them beating both Fury and Liquid. I think the Cloud9 upset, as much as I want to be like, oh my god, go IHC, that just me that just shows me Cloud9 is dog shit right now. Cause like Annihilation should never be able to beat Shiro. Like let let, let me say this very frankly. Annihilation is a bad opera. Uh even domestically, I don't think he's, you know, anywhere close to the best uh in in the position right now. And Sure, he's had some good clutches. He's had some good maps here, there as well. But he has not been able to perform. He's not been able to like hone his skill to the point where, hey, this guy can go beyond just I'm repeaking, repeaking and killing people, right? Which is sort of what I expect from annihilation. I think what a lot of people expected yep. from annihilation as well. So um, the fact that like beating Cloud Nine is just sort of inexcusable. I did actually think they had a pretty good chance of beating Liquid, to be honest. Um, and uh, part of that was down to the map veto and whatnot as well. Uh, and again, against Furia as well, because as far as those riflers are concerned, they've proven themselves, right? Like Blitz, Techno, uh, more than the rest, probably have proven themselves that they can frag. And despite Bartek being a stand-in, Cabal was never like a high fragging individual. He just made a lot of really good decisions and he could make some good plays at times. And I think I'd seen enough from Bartek where I was like, okay, fragging-wise, he's not going to hold him down uh, beyond what Cabal would have anyway. Uh, so, you know, they, they actually should have a chance against teams that have bad opus and don't have, like, the absolute <laughs> god mode, like, rifle players in the world. Now, Furia does have Kaserata, so you are kind of close to that in all fairness, but, um, you know, all you need is, like, a, a bit of a worse game because they also have a worse IGL than man for man overall. And there, there's all of those question marks around Furia as well. So, uh, not too surprised by the Furia result, to be honest, but definitely the Cloud9 one just, that, that blew me away. I think just to chime in, you know, the idea that Furia and C9 are both the teams that get taken down by IHC when they're almost in, in similarly, I guess, critical positions, you know, where a lot of people are putting emphasis on Art as an in-game leader and Nafani as an in-game leader in terms of, <laughs> yeah. they make playoffs very frequently, but their play style almost just, they they live and die by almost over-aggression because something, something in their brain switches when it gets to the playoffs and they just decide like, ah, you know what, I'm going to do this super hyper risky play that I wouldn't have done in the groups. And that seems to be a trend for both of these squads. So it is it is weirdly thematic that I'd see we're able to, to beat both somehow because they're both, I think, subject to a lot of criticism because people expect them to be top eight, top 10 teams in the world. And I not to mention, both... go on. sorry, just to add on to that, I think they're also two teams that are much more anti shradable actually, in all fairness, yeah. than others. And when you add into the fact uh, that, you know, IHC is never going to be anti shredded by these teams. Cloud9 didn't expect IHC to make it that far. Fury didn't expect IHC to make it that far. Pain is literally the only team that could have feasibly actually thought about anti shredding IHC because it's Katowice. So there's 24 teams here. You're realistically prepping for like at l like 10 to 12 at most because this is also not that far off for the player break. So there's a lot of time to actually like put in to be like, oh no, do my hands still work? Right? So you IHC... This was the perfect storm for them. I do think they can succeed more. I do think they will succeed more in the future. Don't get me wrong. But this was definitely like the perfect set of teams for them to go up against. Yeah, I think it's both poetic and a mark of how different they are to, to previous teams we've seen from the Asian region that they beat these two over-aggressive teams. It shows a level of discipline. Like That's how you beat Fury is you, you, you're more patient than them. You let them over aggress into you and you punish it and IHC are actually able to do that whereas you know we've seen teams like Tai Lu, um, even Vici at times are a little bit too loose and they're going to get punished by the people like Fury and Chaos Arato as you mentioned is just going to rip your head off anytime you overstep um, going back to Annihilation as well um, 
I think a lot of the more impressive things he did were with um, either the rifle or the sidearm, the deagle. Um, I think that I think you're probably as an author, he doesn't actually stand up to some of the better authors, but he he seems to know his way around a clutch, and that's. I, I think when I went back and looked at the the two big results, the amount of clutches I hate C one was was insane, like big yeah. clutches in really important rounds. I think that's. I, I don't know if that's a good sign or if it's a sign that maybe this is a little bit unsustainable. I'm wondering if you think that's a, that's true. It probably is unsustainable if you're relying on Annihilation to be a rifling, clutching kind of opera, which is, you know, it's a strange sentence to ever to come out. But it's it's weird because he was, in some respects, he was pretty brainless once upon a time. <laughs> like, very high mechanical ability, just... Again, we t- talked about like the the repeaking everything. He took his name very seriously. He wanted to just be aggressive, and didn't give a didn't give a fuck basically. Um, I I liked that about Annihilation, but he needed to undergo some sort of metamorphosis, and he did to a certain like the past two teams, NKT and even IHC. He has played far more restrained. Like he actually follows sort of traditional fallback paths. And, you know, every now and again, he'll maybe let loose and say, ah, well, you know, I know I read this in a book, but I'm just going to ignore it for now. And it didn't seem like that that was going to change too much. What was strange to see was just how intelligently he was playing clutches. Like, he wasn't wasn't trying to rush into getting an opening kill when he was in, like, a 1v3. I'm thinking about the one on Anubis, where he's trapped inside of the site, and he just played it patient when Furia did the exact same. Um, And that's... That's a crazy thing to do when part of your mantra in the early days of your your playing career was just, I'm going to give it to you. You're you're just going to get exactly the the level I'm putting down. Um, So it's it's cool to see how much he's come a long way. That said, yeah, I mean, he needs to ult if he's going to be the ulper for this team. Otherwise, there is no future for, for IHC in terms of effectively beating more teams outside of their traditional region. And I mean... Just to sort of pick up from there, is okay. It's cool um, to see all these clutches. First of all, to answer your question about sustainability, I think this is actually sustainable in terms of their mental fortitude, at the very least. Because one thing that I'd see have shown us domestically and internationally is that you can you can you can be down against them. You can get back up to fourteen fourteen, and they'll still win it at sixteen fourteen. Right. This is this is one of the important things that I think they have that literally no other team in Asia has, even Rare Atom, in my opinion, that the ability to reset after having the enemy team make like mount like a full comeback against you in such a critical position, that's very impressive to me. Um and sure, sometimes that might come off of a clutch or like an individual play, but also I feel like once once every eight rounds or so, you can sort of expect that from any team that's playing at a level like this, right? So, like, it's it would be unfair to say, is it going to be as crazy as some of the stuff we saw here? Probably not, right? Probably not. Uh, but that being said, they have the makings of being a very clutch team, and they've now we've even seen them in front of a crowd, right? Like the 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 Rio major was against Zero Zero Nation was against the crowd, uh, and very much against the crowd. So, uh, yeah, I, I feel like there is that sustainability there more than maybe uh, I would give credit to other teams for. But, yes, some of those individual plays aren't going to be. Especially when you consider, I mean, sure, you were talking about clutching, but look at the game against Liquid, like on Inferno. Annihilation practically single-handedly lost them that game on CT side, where he just, like, misses out three perfect opportunities to get, like, an off pick on Banana, where he's just set up for everything. So... Things like that, you can't afford to let happen. It doesn't matter how smart he becomes or whatever it happens because, you know, this is sort of one of the tragedies of it. I don't care if he's got the brains. If he can't hit, like, a straight off shot down banana when he's in position, he's not being flashed off and he's being peeked into while playing on an off angle, and he gets a chance to fire, he just misses. Right? Like, I can't have that happen. That's just simply unacceptable on any level of Counter-Strike. It's very unusual to be talking about an Asian team and be complaining that you know two of the players are intelligent but actually just can't frag in, in Bartak and in a sense Annihilation. Like it's 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 an unusual conversation to be having from the teams we've seen 
like you're in, in internationally before. Uh, I've got to jump in on that one. Sorry, Michael. No. Um, yeah, it's like, uh, sorry, because this is like sort of like a, tr a bit of a trigger point for me. We need to accept that analysts and talent and 90% of people just do not watch Asian Counter-Strike and they've got no clue about it, right? Like this is, th that's just the truth of the matter. This is the same thing that Michael used to get triggered about back in like 20, uh, like 2020 when we each added was like, is to quote him, he's like, everyone says it's CIS Counter-Strike. Bro, there's like 17 different CIS Counter-Strikes. Right, they need to shut up about this, and I and I'll, I'll say the exact same thing. Right, people have got no idea what they're talking about when they talk about Asian Counter Strike, and that's fine. Because listen, I'm not telling you to watch it because there's so much other stuff to watch. Right, you're not going to have time the same way. So even when I see people like, for example, on desks and whatnot, saying that, oh my god, this video doesn't favor IT because it's Inferno, then it's overpassed. I don't remember what the last one was against Liquid, but. Uh, I'll just quickly check, and it's like it was like it's Inferno, Overpass, and Mirage. I'm just like, yo, they first pick Inferno and Mirage. Overpass is something they very commonly like will be comfortable playing into in deciders. And what are you talking about? This veto doesn't favor. This is like one of the best vetoes they could get. So again, it might feel weird to say, oh, hey, there's smart players, but there's not firepower. But the reason why it feels weird is because we're everyone's still running on the fumes of 2018 Tai Lu. People, people, like, again, people still look at NKT and they're like, wow, Bintet's on that team, man. He must be, like, really fragging out. Yo, Bintet is garbage compared to some of the yeah, other guys. Uh, Bintet think, hasn't been good for a while, from what I remember. I think it mainly comes down to when you play Europeans or we play North American teams. It, it's very hard to sort of char characterize each of the regions properly because... Let's let's also not let let's not pretend. You know there are Asian teams within the circuit that do just play like dumb Counter Strike. Yeah. You know, very like looks like a pug. Will play very sporadically, and there doesn't really seem to be much structure. Those teams do exist. The problem that that happens is that you'll maybe catch one or two of those games, and then think that that's perpetuated throughout the entire scene. Where you know we will have a a breakthrough CIS team that are hyper aggressive and that tailor their I guess strategies or their game plan around being that that hyper aggressive style, um, but there are others that actually very closely emulate European Counter Strike and the sort of Danish. Oh, we'll we'll play reserve, we'll play very fixed setups, and then adapt them as we go. There are Asian teams that do that too. Um, maybe the the reproduction of it isn't quite as good, or it's not as well rehearsed. But they are they've tried to structure themselves in such a way that they can compete internationally, but. Then you have this skill gap and also the fact that you get less repetitions against these teams to actually test that these work against the Europeans that you're sort of preparing yourself for. It's not always so translatable. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you pushed back on the point anyway, because even as I said it, I felt like I, I, I actually don't like we, I only see a very small subsection of Asian Counter-Strike when I watch international events. I've watched uh, Asian events in the past, but it's been a while and I've only seen probably a handful of teams in the few matches they get to play usually before they're, they're sent home. So, I mean, that, that's why we uh, invited two mm -hmm. experts on. Um, which teams do you think are, are the ones within the region who are also ones who play in a very similar, who play in a more methodical style, ways that uh, perhaps the desk don't expect Asian teams to play in? I'll, I'll let you take this one first if you want tea time. Uh, cool. So I think the obvious ones are like from the Mongolian scene right now. So Eruption, IHC, um, and maybe Renewal. Renewal, I'm still sort of... Renewal needs some development before I can really commit to that idea of them being there. And then obviously in China, there's Envision and Rare Atom. And look, when I, uh, there's varying extents towards structure and whatnot as well, right? Because again, we have to simplify Counter-Strike so much for the average pleb that it's just like seeing a structured team just... People, like Michael said, think of Danish Counter-Strike, right? But obviously, uh, it's different. Lenvision will have a lot more, like, sort of individual players who are willing to, like, make a play and go instinctively forward in, like, some sort of weird lurking position where they'll just try and go get a kill. Uh, they've also got, like, an opera who is one of the strangest players I've seen play because I can never tell how good he's going to be because it's like Zacker is somehow out-fragging everyone in like the big matches but in all the little matches he's not getting anything on the map what's going on over here right it, it, it's kind of weird 
Um, Eruption is like this big team on the come up in the Mongolian region. They're the second best Mongolian team right now. They could actually end up competing to be better than IHC, in my opinion, in like a little while, especially if they're given like a chance to boot camp, something like it. Rare Adam is obviously the former Vichy team. The Chinese teams generally have an advantage, which is that they have a lot more opportunities and a lot more finances to boot camp. So from what I know, that Rare Adam and Libvision, and maybe sometimes even like a couple of the other Chinese teams, including Tailu, will very often go and boot camp in Europe. Uh, the Mongolian teams, not so much. So you're going to see a lot more like drilling, a lot more anti shredding a lot more like set plays. Like, you know, you've, you've seen all these Reddit clips for IHC. There's a reason for that. It's because they don't get to boot camp as often. So you can't be completely reliant on your default in the same way. So you make up for it in the way you can. But, you know, domestic competition obviously isn't going to be the same. Yeah. Also, I think one of the one of the names you maybe don't mention is I think Wings Up. You know, just they're they're a team that sometimes look very very good, and then other times will not look anything like the a previous showing. You know, that game against OG, they actually played a very very coherent yeah. and organized Ancient T side, and then you know watch them two weeks down the line on Ancient again <laughs> against a domestic team, and they're not doing any of that. You know, maybe it's it's about playing to the level that you expect sort of pushback from your opponent maybe i i don't know i'm not going to claim to understand the the workings of that team but there's also a very healthy omission from from our talks is that tai lu are, have been probably one of the worst offenders in the region you know they have the mechanics for it but they've i think in well this is uh, i guess my opinion coming out i always thought that they were the most stubborn or the most naive that they would always be at the top of the chinese or the domestic scene and so didn't have to work extra hard to, to sort of take that next step up because they'd already they already have the highest stock in the region, effectively. But as, we, as as we've seen from the past couple of years, like that's just not been the case. Tyloo have are kind of lost for direction. Yet we still have these players that I think most people and most analysts that have sort of watched these guys play think they have the ability to do it. And, I, and I, I'd be right there with them. It just it feels like they lack the the extra motivation or the drive to to achieve that that second level. I mean, if Dan King could speak Mongolian and you could put him in IHC, God damn, that would be a lineup. That would be a lineup. Yeah. Do you think um, the as uh, you just mentioned the way Tyloo played and it being so, or I'll use the term erratic. Uh, do you think that actually has um, done a disservice to and sort of harmed the image almost of of the region because of their play style? I'll have you know I prefer the term erotic for how Tyloo played in 2018. Not erratic, oh, yeah. but thank you. Yeah, Michael, you can go. <laughs> the way somebody played, especially, I love that. Guy. You right. just wanted to, you just wanted to get that quiff in. That yeah, was just it. in that case. Was just in case. Yeah. Um, I I would say yes. Um, simply because I don't think many people would be able to name many of these rosters that exist in the Asian region. Um, I think uh, to a certain degree, I'd struggle if we if we had we all properly pull on the spot about it. Um, but at the same time, they they've kind of done it to themselves and. It was perpetuated a little bit when you would see Tyloo compete domestically is that they other teams would just try and outdo them. You know, they'd try and, I guess, earn the spot of these Tyloo players on the team being like, ah, well, I just, I'll just shoot harder than you. Um, and it's not like playing sort of man for man or, or, or pitting off mechanics against teams has worked out negatively for players in the past. I know for a fact that Rare Adam have players that were just picked up from pugging services yeah. like those guys mercury and mosea have actually ended up becoming like diamonds for that team to yeah. succeed so it's it's a weird balance to strike uh it's just it's just unfortunate that tyloo are what people remember when they think asian cs because there have been no other significant marks in in sort of csgo history to sort of detract from that apart from maybe like an mvp phoenix but all the South Korean players are gone. Zayn, NKT, is, he's all that's left. I think, the, so just to sort of extend Michael's point, which is that there have been more teams. There was, you know, there was the uh, Lucid Dream team. There was the Boot Dreamscape team. There was the uh, Paper Rex at one point as well, right? Like, there have been teams, but the problem in Asian Counter-Strike is, um, well, first of all, obviously, people really don't, haven't been watching Counters right that long, so most of the people are like Tylo. Man, these guys didn't even watch like the 2016 runs for Tylo. These guys didn't even watch when Tylo was top ten in the world, right? Like these are people who just say Tylo because they read it on, on Asian TV forums a lot. They read it on Reddit a lot, and they're just like, yeah, well, you know, we've seen them sometimes at some point. So yeah, we're also 
So you have most people haven't even watched Tyloo play really uh, from back then. It's not, and then putting that into the context of the meta around it, it wasn't that far behind, right? Because Astralis are the one who revolutionized Counter Strike. That, that happened in 2018, 2019. A lot of the Tai Lu fame and whatnot came from before that, when the gap didn't seem that big. You know, when you'd go to these WSGs and stuff like that, and you'd be like, actually, there could be an upset happening. There could be these things happening, right? So there's always that caveat to consider. But then also just to build on uh, it, the history of these players have been lost. So even if you wanted to build that up later on, because obviously MVP Phoenix have lost all of their players except for Zion. There's that gone. Uh, the the Maple team, which was just this fantastic Thai uh, team from Thailand. I think Kents was on it as well as like a couple of other players, Leaf and a few others who I it might even be playing like Valorant right now. I'm not sure, but they're all of these guys are gone, right? So so Asian Counter Strike misses out on all of the additional possibility of them leveling up because those guys weren't getting money. So Tyloo. And the style that Tyler is perpetuating maintains on. And the time you need to overcome raw firepower to build up that structure is more. So the time investment couldn't actually come in from a lot of these Asian teams up until the point when the internet servers and actual routing in Asia got better to the point where places like Mongolia and whatnot could get a lot more involved in the scene. So Mongolia now gets much better ping to Hong Kong, much better ping to Singapore, uh, you know, these teams are so much more connected in a way that where they can actually technologically play together better. So that's a lot of the, there's so many other factors that go into this, but obviously you can't expect everyone to know those things, but these are the kinds of things which have pushed Asia forward in a way where, man, I see this team has been together for like two years now, right? That's a lot of time to build up structure. That's a lot of time to really build up protocols. And sure, there has been tweaking, there's been iteration, but that's why they've gotten this good. Yeah, I'd just like to jump into the fact that as well, you have to also consider the inf the infrastructure has improved, but even still for Asia qualifiers, I know we talk about this a yeah. decent amount, the routing between regions can just be terrible. I mean, yeah. you're, you're, you, people want to talk about how East Coast and West Coast can't find servers in the States and, you know, oh, we have to play Central, we have to play Central. Sometimes you have to play East Coast on in Asia if you're sort of Central Asia. And that yep. doesn't make sense because you have to having to play sometimes East Russian teams or teams from the, I guess, northern regions of China or potentially even Mongolia. Like these are yeah. not regions that are close geographically. And, you know, these are massive land masses. Yes. And the routing is, as far as I'm aware, and from my experience when I lived in, in Asia, terrible. Like they are, it is not built for intercommunication in, in sort of fast internet speed lanes. It's just not designed that way. And, and that's within, like, the quote-unquote known regions of Counter-Strike, right? But, like, look at how Mongolia has been a big discovery. I am telling you right now, the GCC in Pakistan, as well as, you know, to some extent, India, the this region would have been a gem for Counter-Strike if Valorant hadn't come and swooped everything away. But the problem is, again, two, twofold. First of all, it's routing. That's, to some extent, unavoidable. I don't really agree with that completely. I think there's ways around, but they just haven't been explored yet. But... The second is just tournament organizers kind of be like fucking stupid, right? Like, like they make they make terrible decisions when it comes to like server allotment and things like this, etc. And sure, recently they've gotten a lot better at fixing them, right? So, for example, like the most recent one, and I wouldn't term this as this really stupid category, but the most recent one was like the ESL Middle Eastern qualifiers didn't have Pakistan and India in them, even though the only place where Pakistan and India get underneath like. A uh, hundred ping is basically Dubai, right? So you can't compete. So if we wanted to compete, because I remember because we missed the sign up because of this, um, if you want to compete in like the RMR qualifiers, you have to play rest of Asia, which is Hong Kong. So you have to play 150 ping with 10% packet loss, right? When there's a 50 ping server right next to me that I could just play on instead. So, so it's, I've uh, it's a lot followed of you on Twitter like for long enough to know yeah. that you have these problems. <laughs> yeah, so, so so there's that. And then, and then obviously there's other things as well where it's like, for example, East Russian teams have become a lot more involved within Asian Counter-Strike now as well. The problem is East Russian teams can only literally play on one or two server clusters, which means that if you include them, it moves out basically the rest of Asia as well if you're not looking out to the, like, the eastern side of it. So there's all of these problems that still exist where it's like there's ways around them those ways lead to some extent money and to a large extent 
actual creativity and uh, interest and time. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. those things aren't really always there. I think IHC spoke, I think during broadcast, they had given an interview talking about the, the issues they've had um, in getting scrims. And I think they said they were playing just on European servers. Yeah, we did I mean, that I think too. they said, yeah, it's like, that. there's no way that you can't build good habits playing on 100 ping. Like you, you can't play the same way. You, I mean, I, I've played with people playing from America on 100 ping and, you know, you they can't hold angles. Like You can't, you can scrim and you can play the right way, but you won't know if it's working because you'll, you'll lose fights you should win and vice versa. Like it, you can kind of see... As I, I think it's just going to build bad habits if you if you do that. I, uh, obviously, if you're a bit more disciplined, like IHC, they can use it, but it, it's not ideal, and it's not it, a good way to practice. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with how people approach practice. I think yeah. there there can be sometimes an overfixation on if you're going to into practice, you're trying to win the practice. Like if you're if you're practicing setups and you're practicing executes and you're focused on like spacing you know these are core things that will carry over into a game where even if your aim is slightly off surely there's enough there to compensate um you can sometimes mitigate that to a certain degree but it's not it's not ideal and it's not good practice for your uh, scrim partner very often as well because they're actually they want to account like say your t side barrage and you're the team with 150 ping you'll swing out you might not get a single kill coming out of ramp and that's actually not good practice for cts trying to figure out how they're going to rotate and how, how they get retake protocols and all this. Um, so it can actually be, to a certain degree, a disservice to the teams you scrim as well. Even if even if they want to do it, they're open to it, it might not be the most valuable practice for them. Um, so there's problems with practicing Europeans, but also, uh, and I'm not speaking about like from the European side of things, because like a lot of the times you will just be scrimming maybe like main teams even. Uh when I was coaching a Middle Eastern team, we were getting some pretty high level scrims, even with like some of the bottom top 40 teams and stuff. But, uh, you know, a lot of the time it was main teams. And generally speaking, when we would get like the really good scrim, it's when those guys just can't find someone to scrim that particular map within that time or someone canceled and they just want anyone at all. They're, they're like, well, okay, these guys at least try to play like human beings and they don't just like rush at us or something like this. So yeah, we'll, we'll scrim with them. We'll just see what we can get out of it and whatnot. Uh, as far as, what you are learning, you learn a lot more than there is given credit for, which is why I hate North American like teams are always whining about how you can't get good practice because especially if you're living on East Coast, you can get like 90 ping to Europe or something like it. Um, you can get some really good practice as long as your coach is there to smack someone on the back of the head if they're just trying to take advantage of Pika's, uh, Pika's advantage or something like it, right? So what does good, ping, uh, good practice look like? Good practice looks like, so, you know, if you're screaming uh, overpass as an example, what the hell am I going to do when there's like four more flashes thrown to get banana that I'm used to because my, no one in my region throws flashes? These decision trees are not developed. You need to force them to be developed. You, even if you've got an amazing coaching staff, you can't be just teach everyone all the flowcharts. They have to be like, men, like muscle memoried in. So even if you're thinking that, uh, even if, for example, Michael is mentioning that you're doing a disservice to the other team, I would sort of oppose that to some extent and say, if you are putting in more practice for more setups because you've got fewer matches, you've got more like server time, you've got all of these things, a lot of teams are more willing to even scrim you, even if they're like, yeah, we're going to win our duels more likely than not if we're given straight 1v1s, but these guys just don't give us straight 1v1s. So you get to a point where because your spacing is so good, because these things are so good, on the basis of trading, you are still providing in a very conducive scrim environment. It, it, it's weird, but even, again, IHC is probably doing much better than we were, but even when we were playing like uh, like the, the Middle Eastern team that I was coaching, even when we were playing up against like some of these bottom top 40 teams and stuff, we would end up going like sometimes even 20-10 in scrims, right? So it's it's not like it's completely useless for either side because in one way you are providing them a higher level scrim experience than they would normally get. And the other way, you are getting a lot more diversity than you would ever get. Because for IHC, otherwise, you're just scrimming four teams over and over again. And that's a waste of everyone's time. Of course, nothing is going to be better practice than playing um, the official games they got. And the, I think one thing, one of the reasons, another reason the, the uh, region 
struggled to develop is just a lack of repetition, a lack of games um, in the big events. Um, do you, like, do you think, I, I've seen people before when, when we had the Asian minor, they would say, oh, Asian minor is a waste of a spot um, at the major. Um, and I always thought it would actually, you should actually go the other way and have more spots for them so they can get, you can develop the region more. Do you think that would help or do you think that would just be, uh, just, just in, like be worse in the end? I mean, I, I would never oppose having more slots in the Asia division because it always feels like you almost end up with a disservice, like having three best of threes to decide who, or like potentially you only play two best of threes or, um, or something of the sort, and then you just, you're just out. And yep. sure, I see I've been able to make it the past two times, and that's cool. But in some in some ways, there has to be some level of safety net. Like you want the best teams out of this region traditionally. Sometimes these, uh, I mean, a rare Adam has missed out on those chances because they've underperformed in these qualifiers. I think that they would probably, des- they in some ways deserve the repetitions on international stages because they've missed out in in years gone by because of visa issues or there's. Sometimes issues with travel, or there were restrictions due to COVID, and now they've they've effectively been leapfrogged by an IHC that, that yeah that have gotten the most international exposure of any of the teams in the region now for what coming up on fourteen months. So it's it is kind of ridiculous, and I don't think having more slots will change that. You know, I mean, I'm not saying more slots in the fact that more teams from the Asia region qualified. You just want to make sure you get the right teams to, yeah. to actually make it out of the region. So so this is where I think it's really important to ignore the fact that Valve will never let us do any of the things that I'm about to say. I just, just, just giving this disclaimer. Because you need nuance for this conversation. Because you cannot compromise the quality of a major. Like, I, I love the Asian region. I wanted to develop everything. You can't compromise your world championship. But if you want to make the argument that, well, NA teams kind of suck as well, and probably some of the bottom EU teams are kind of bad, like, you know, bad news Eagles and whatnot, much love out to them, but I'm pretty sure IAC has a chance against them, right? Like, the Rare Adam might even be favored against them, to be honest. So, you know, some of these bottom teams at the major for EU and whatnot, most of the NA teams, yeah, I think the best situation would be that there should be some fixed slots, right? Maybe just like two apiece or whatnot, but then just have like a battle royale between another eight to 10 teams to fight for maybe two or three more spots, right? Just the wild card qualifier and let that go through. Let that be like the real crucible for those teams. You give them more chances and whatnot. Michael is 100% right in what he's saying about the right teams as well. And I think eight teams in the RMR is a good step forward to it. Um, but that being said, I do think we have to think about like the right teams overall at the major and anything that's going to be like more competition for those last few spots will just give us the better teams right like like who wouldn't have wanted imperial and double o nation to not be i mean other than the fact that it's in rio but i i wouldn't want imperial and double o nation to be at a major i just want them to lose in like the fucking crucible or whatever it would be to be like hey let's just get the hell out we let rare adam come in there instead cuz rare adam would fuck your shit up any day of the week uh let like EU team number 17 G2 esports come into it and play the crucible uh, like let them come through let them go and make a play for it yeah go for it because the other thing that I think a lot of people forget is the RMRs are quite literally the most money you will ever make in your life if you're getting stickers right the major yeah. doesn't give you as much money as sticker money does unless maybe you go out and win it like if you're not top three in the major even then it's probably close yeah probably I mean Probably, uh, to be honest, I think winning the major beyond like the sticker capsule, it gives you probably less in terms of prize money than sticker money is going to give you overall. So I'm just saying, let teams have a better chance to fight for it. Let teams have a better reason to invest into it. Because saying that, oh, well, Asia region should have more slots, I disagree with that. But saying that Asia region needs to get to top 16 to be valid for more slots, I also disagree with that because there's a lot of other garbage teams out there. Right? So can't we just have them all fight and see who's the least trash i have to say i love this idea this is pretty much exactly what i would do as well i think it's quite pertinent you bring up like the imperial and zero zero nation because ihc quite literally 
beat Zero Zero Nation. Like I think you've proven that you you've said like IHC maybe not even the best team in the region, and they are better than Zero Zero Nation. They are better than Imperial. That Evil they Geniuses. might be better than. They're probably better than Evil Geniuses. Exactly. Like and like uh, North and South America had all these spots, and I'm thinking like, would Rare Atom be any worse than this? Like. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, even wings up at times can can. We've seen them beat European teams probably more than Zero Zero Nation or Imperial ever will. So just just to quickly jump in as well, just to repeat some of the EU teams. I don't just want this to be like, oh hey yeah, but like you know NAE will always suck and whatever. Okay, but 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 hear me out, right? You got Gamer Legion. I love them. They can lose to some of these NA teams, some of these EU teams. You've got Sprout. You've got Bad News Eagles. Hell, maybe even like Ens is slightly vulnerable right now, right? Uh, OG, if 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 they're not but having OG like a great lost time. wings up, like yeah, yeah. I, in all fairness, like they were super jet light there. There's a lot of caveats there. Of I'm course, not... but you know, it's it's not like completely out there to suggest yes, they might. Also, they arrived like, like two or three days before they actually had to play, so surely that's the adaption period that you would allow yourself. But that's the same period, surely that these teams have no, no. going to European events. I also think they flew private, from my understanding. Yeah. Okay. so that, yeah, that's that... cool. I didn't know that, but regardless, my point is generally is there's a lot of teams at the major, even outside of EU, like NA and Asia, which probably are susceptible to losing and that they should be forced to fight harder right even also hell maybe even give some more teams from the rmrs some chance of like that why not you know maybe give g2 a second chance at what on, a, on a, like a proper land to go up against some of these american teams even if i end up having like an extra three european teams if my major is better my major is better yeah it's like a like a very similar to what blast do i guess with the showdown Yes, yes, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's, that, there's some issues with the way that's run as well. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that's perfect. I don't particularly I, like. I would the actually like it at most to like uh, the Pro League Conference last time over. Yeah. They just brought all the teams that qualified and had them effectively fight for their spots. Like there was no, oh, you're an Asian team, you would get a, a, a position like this. This current league of uh, the season of Pro League, I'm, you know, we. We definitely commentated over it. After we're, we're excited for the fact that it's going to be two Asian teams, but at the same time, it doesn't feel like they've had to work as hard as they would have Different. if they had to go through a conference where you actually have to face against European teams to even get there. Like it feels like we've we've simplified the process in an effort to maybe get more exposure for a rare Adam or for an IHC or maybe even a Lin Vision. If you know, come the next conference stages, we'd be able to do it. Uh, but that's kind of what you want to to see. You, you don't, I. I don't want Asia to just be handed slots just because it's easy for the, the demographic expansion of the game and viewership. Yeah. I want them to be excited for when there's a genuine accomplishment there because they've worked harder, because they've actually built up some of the infrastructure to make it work. You know, just just being given things because your your region is maybe struggling a bit, that's where, you know, these these league systems can come into play. Hell, run some small, run some tournaments in the region if you really want to encourage growth, instead of just lumping it in with the major and saying, "Hey, well, let's see how the Asian teams are again." Yeah, the major can't be the fix to everything, right? Like you need some actual structural change. The reason why Mongolia has gone so much better is very heavily also attributed to the fantastic services that MISA, the Mongolian Esports Association, have been providing in terms of like a lot of domestic tournaments, a lot of like officials like IHC still IHC and Eruption still compete in these domestics they're like five thousand ten thousand dollar cups that happen and you know the the eighth best team in Mongolia gets a chance to play IHC right there's a reason why Mongolia still has so much talent that even when IHC has you know had two players moved out since that first major that they made it to they're 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 still competitive they're still good even though arguably both of those players are still not very good in the firepower department yeah, no, that's uh, that's true. It's it's become uh, a hotbed of of talent almost, very similar to how I think um, European teams are now looking to Israel as like a a real hotbed of talent. Yeah. It's, it's sort of almost developed out of nowhere from a European perspective, but obviously they've actually had that infrastructure. They've they've built up and they're reaping the rewards. Yeah. yeah. Also, can I just say? I mean, from from our the major that we had for for Rio, I mean to see like literal FPL mixed teams make it 
over some of the other teams that exist in the ecosystem. Like those are the European teams that are beatable and clearly yeah. don't have enough structure to deal with, you know, firepower. If if Asia is going to be categorized by simply firepower, you know, they could have replaced a fantasy or a benched heroes potentially in, in a European RMR circuit if that was open to them. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Yeah, the, not a single person could convince me that either of those teams would beat Rare Atom or, or IAC. Yeah. Like, I mean, Jam Young would be comfortably the best player in the server I get in either of those games, as far as I'm concerned. He's, I, I really enjoy watching Jam Young play whenever yeah. I get the chance, but you don't get very very many at the moment. Because... You're a man of exquisite taste, Elliot. Yeah, yeah he's like every time I've seen him, he's just he's just yeah. so intelligent as a player, but. As you say, Rare Atom keep sort of choking the qualifiers and and not qualifying. But sometimes that... they do qualify, they just run into like scheduling or sometimes visa Beatles, issues. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a nightmare for them, I think. Yeah, I mean that's I guess that's that's another thing that's stopping uh, stopping them developing, isn't it? Like they actually just physically couldn't get to events during uh, during COVID times. With that's how uh, do sorry, have to was... also remember that they did. For the first like sort of qualifier back, they did compete in Restoration instead of in China because they were afraid of Tai Lu, and that's how they didn't make it to the RMR, and they didn't have a chance to actually come to out on top. I feel like you are kind of reaping what you're sowing out there a little bit as well, right? Like you you, you try yeah. and gain the system, eventually you're gonna get burned. And it's weird for them to be scared of Tai Lu as well. This is a long Surely... time ago. Uh, the Tai Lu oh, okay. came back then. Yeah, this is like a year oh, and a half okay. ago, I think. So it's all it's all good. Yeah, I suppose. I just get salty about teams doing that. So, yeah, no, I mean that, that's. I mean, it's very, didn't Gigi Howell do something a little bit? Uh, uh, was it Gigi two... Howell plays Middle Eastern. Oh, okay, that's not quite as. But yeah. I remember it being. It was kind of like a strange mixed team. Yeah, uh, it seemed a little bit out of place. Look, that, for the rest that's of what like some of the CIs players always do. Like they just get like Davkos and Face Crack or someone like that, and they're like, ah, let's. Let's go bone the Middle Eastern qualifier, right? Yeah, and then it's like, okay, great guys. Now, uh, to be honest, I wish more teams would do that. I'll, I'll be fully straight with you. I wish that Smuya, Kalex, you know, the all of these like players who are clearly not going to make it into Tier One Europe, man, just go, just go play Middle Eastern. I don't care. Just, just do it. Give those players the experience and whatnot, and they're going to end up being better than them in two years anyway. Right? Like, like you're you're just going to foster competition. I'm okay with imports coming in and being like, oh my God, we're going to game the system. You're, you're just making us better than you're ever going to be in like two years. The, the most important thing is actually giving them the chance to be platformed. You know, like yeah. these, if they work with and they end up playing with people that are actually decent or need a little bit of refinement, that's a, that's effectively how people scout new talent. You know, they'll see them achieve something that they otherwise wouldn't have been and be like, oh, actually, there's somebody we can work with here. Yes. You know, then you'll get a like a Boros or a Flames or something, but actually have it happen more organically outside of just pugs and, you know, the FPL circuit, because that seems to be where everyone's pulling talent from these days. From what I remember, the Boros pickup was, like, uh, endpoint, from what I gather, have a, have a sort of, like, money ball type system where he just nearly all... They, they'd never even watched the guy play. They just, like, looked at his numbers and thought he was, like, amazing and bought him in. And it, I mean, it kind of worked for them, in a sense. Yeah. And, not actually made any money on it. I mean, so. I think it was the same with Flames to a certain degree. Like they they sort of scouted him based on the fact that you know did well in and they looked at the statistics. Yeah, they seem to have some sort of algorithm that goes, this is an emerging player from X region, and maybe you could take the risk. Which is, you know, it's a cool way to approach talent development if you're going to be one of these teams that I guess benefits from being a feeder team to a certain degree. Like Endpoint, as far as I'm aware, are structured in such a way that. The, the players that coexist on this roster are also somewhat they somewhat amplify their their imports so that if they do get traded they get a little kickback it's like thanks for using referral code mighty max <laughs> I think they're pretty <laughs> public about that as well like uh, yeah endpoint yeah I think they did yeah. a press release about it at one point yeah it, it's just um I don't know it's, it's very uh alien content it just reminded me when you talked about Boris getting picked up <laughs> I think um one of the issues, I, I they probably like to do that a lot more with Chinese players, but obviously a lot of Chinese players don't speak English either at all or um, well enough that it becomes a lot harder to import them. So I don't actually know if whether they want to even touch Asian players generally because of visa stuff. Because the thing is, like, I know so many, 
I know so many players who are like genuinely fantastic players, like like the kind of players that you would one hundred percent take the risk on if you are not a top twenty team, uh, who are fluent in English, and I mean like fluent, fluent. But then it's just like the the kind of effort you need to put in to get them their visas and stuff like that. Or just aren't willing to do that when FPL is right around the corner, and it. There are arguments to be made. Like, for example, I could say that for um, I'm biased about this player because I'm a good friend of his, but, you know, Pokemon, the Pakistani player, the best Pakistani player to ever sort of play. Um, but th- th- this guy, again, this sounds like it's a bad thing, but I also understand why he does this happens. But Pokemon doesn't play for, like, two and a half, three months. Comes back, for, like, bugs for two weeks, and he's literally just, like, the best player in Asia. Like when he when he when he's just done that, and the reason why he doesn't play for two three months is he's just like yo I'm it just gets depressing because every time there's an org trying to pick him up there's a team they just won't facilitate his visa process and they're just and he just goes like well man like what's the point of me being fucking good right like and the guy's been insane for years to the point where you should one hundred percent try he's even got LAN experience now right like international LAN experiences and that and everything and repeatedly what you end up having and similarly I think even if you look over like probably some of the Mongolian uh, players and whatnot but you know I am surprised I'm amazed that none of the American orgs have tried to pick up some of these players by now because I do know that they are maybe not as fluent in English as Pakistanis would be but then you know they're fluent enough where it's like yeah give him three months of language classes and he'll be he'll be doing pretty well to be honest so again you got to take gambles but if, if you're lazy then you're not going to. <laughs> yeah, especially if you take any of the players that seem to jump through like international rosters in the Asia region. Like you have multiple nationalities on one team. You know, I'm looking, yeah. I'm looking ma- mainly, I think, at NKT here. Like all those guys will communicate in English. And so therefore you have a, a foundation to work off of. If, if maybe they're outside of Counter-Strike English isn't so good, but enough to, you, if you can communicate what's what's going on, then yeah, the rest can be sort of made up for in classes and the sort but it's it's another thing where i think people have probably looked back at the machine gun splice adventure way back when and thought that was an experiment that was so out of left field but also probably was way ahead of its time and <laughs> probably w- wasn't worth the risk that that splice took in the end i think that's the first and probably the only time I'll ever hear the machine gun to splice move described as ahead of its time. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I do know what you mean, though. It is a, a risk that you imagine now would be a bit more like foreseeable. I, we had um, uh, Urcast on um, he was, he was Greyhound, on Greyhound for a while yeah. as well. I mean, look, just just to even like carry that on, even if you look at the most recent one that you would consider to be successful, Gen G picking a Bintet, right? That was, uh, what, early 2020? They did that too late. They were a year yeah. too late on that, right? Like every time you were trying to, if you have to wait for a player to be hyped for a year, you are too late, right? Like that's true of anywhere in the world. Yep. If the player is hyped for a year, you're too late. He's he's yep. built too many habits. He he's, it's gonna take too long for him to unlearn things. It's gonna, you need to be there earlier. You need to be there right when the hype is starting off. Or hell, if the hype has reached a peak. Has he done it internationally? Right. If he's done it internationally, just don't don't even wait. Pick him up. If you are interested yep. in something like it, and sure, in the past, China was hard to get past, right? Because China means you've got really high buyouts, you've got really difficult to work around contracts, you've got you know maybe even some high player salaries in some cases. I'm pretty sure the Rear Adam guys are being played pretty well. It's a big org uh, behind them and whatnot. But then you look over towards IEC where it's just like, yeah, financial fraud by the owners. Okay, guys, there's five players who just finished top 12 at uh, Katowice. Uh, okay, uh, Neil and nice to have met you. Nice to have known you. We're bringing in Blitz. It's it's cute that you think EG would ever cut a player. They would not <laughs> just sign another roster. They could just sign a fifth roster. Hey, to be honest, they're four. To right? be honest, I think that Two of the EG players' salaries is enough to sign all of IHC and the staff with it and fund the travel costs I would have taken to get them. And maybe get the owner out of jail as well. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, that, like, this is true, though. Like, somebody like EG, why would you not take that out? If you're taking a gamble on, like, Pone Alone and John G, like, these types of players, why would you not gamble on 
Uh, uh, yeah, well, the, the, the without marketing. Without being too disrespectful, like, yeah, yeah, we know what these players do. We we know they've been around for long enough. They've been in NA for long enough. You know what these do. Why not take a gamble and sign IHC? Just see what happens. Um, but the, the marketing and their sponsors will probably hate everything about that because they want to be something in North America to a certain degree. You know, they're... Their, I guess their angle these days is being the talent pipeline. You know, we, we've heard heard them talk about yeah. the talent pipeline and how it can lead to some ridiculous results. See, um, <laughs> the, the thing is, they're more like, you know, just like an oil container that's spilled over and now just killing yeah, like everything block. in the sea. Right, so they're just drowning out everyone in North America at this point and being like, well, you guys won't be able to breathe any competition, but it's okay, you're getting paid for it, you're fine, lawsuits, it's all right. And I think the sponsor thing goes away when you're looking at all of the fucking feedback about Evil Genius or CSGO everywhere, right? I'm pretty sure sponsors aren't happy about, you know, whatever the fuck Gamer Doc is doing out there, right? Like whenever she has an <laughs> argument with someone and then it's just like seven videos about it everywhere being like, Richard Lewis, Torin, Kassad, like this person, everyone just piling on the evil geniuses. Like no one, no, the sponsors probably don't like that either. And again, bet P over here, because I like this guy a lot as well. And I and, and I feel bad for, you know, calling this move out because I'm really happy for him. But my point is, if you were going to get a Pakistani player, you got Momo instead of Pokemon? Oh, you got Momo instead of Pokemon? You went through <laughs> all the trouble and you signed Momo. Yeah, I was... I was thinking about whether I should bring that up. Like, hey, Momo's was a good player. He ain't was another one. one. Was, Plut was Pluto nah, Pl as well? Pluto's on ATK. And again, oh, okay. same thing. Just like, if you're going to go to all the trouble of helping a guy out, why not help the best? <laughs> what yeah. they had lived, but they lived in the States for a while, oh, right? On a student visa. I you see. know, you oh, know that's, you, that's that. the loophole. But getting in is the hard part. No, you know, that... no, 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 no. Work visas are still a pain in the ass. Trust me when I say that, right? So, yeah. yeah. I say you would know better than anyone else. But yeah, yeah like, EG can oh, just oh, take yeah, a gamble yeah. on some of these players. Like, they might as well at this point. It's, you've already got 20 players on the payroll. You might as well just add a couple more. I mean, man, we obviously we meme about EG because it's very funny. But, but here's the other <laughs> yeah. thing as well, right? Your mouse NXT. You know, yeah. OGC, all of these academy projects, which can, you know, feasibly play like the CCT, they're feasibly playing maybe even a replay. There's, there's so much tier two European Counter Strike, which they have access to, which their main team is never going to play, but these tournament organizers will still invite them because NXT has mouse behind it, right? So, so yeah, it's not like there isn't a lot of tournaments to play where you can just test these guys out for cheap because. A Pakistani player or like a Mongolian player or like maybe even like a Thai player like Kents or some, you know, most of these Asian uh, players aren't asking you for really high salary. They're just saying, mate, give me a chance. Get, put in the work with me and give me a chance. And and if yeah. I work out, I will be your best investment ever because I'll probably be more loyal to you for giving me that chance for helping me out with visas and everything. I'll probably let you have like a super predatory contract with me as well where it's just like you have an option to like, just double my salary and I'll be happy to be on the main team even if I deserve to be five times more than that, right? So, yeah, but short-sightedness and laziness. Yeah, it's it's always going to be the way. I think people are always... I mean, you see teams would sign like a friend of one of the... Like just a guy they know, they'll just sign him rather than actually what something like what Endpoint were doing where they were just scouring every corner of the earth and go, this guy looks interesting, let's try him because... We can maybe flip him for money, or you know. Whereas I think a lot of teams are just like you know, Evil Genius. Went, oh, who are two teams who have beaten us domestically? We'll just sign them. Yeah. Liquid, like you will always. They always just sign like a young player who's played well against them, and then like not use them properly. It's like well, why well, not scout yeah. them? I mean, you could do that, or you could just sign Shocks as well. You know, I don't think oh, Liquid have been far, <laughs> have been any less lazy in that regard to a certain, like. The the problem that I have is that they'll, I think, I don't know what the internals look like on these conversations, but it must be a, a board of directors looking at past accomplishments from players and thinking like, these guys are free agents, they must be worth the, the money, when the peak of their career is probably past. 
you know, you're you're talking about uh, Smuya or somebody not making in the European scene, maybe competing in you know Middle East or or even Asia to a certain degree to try and make it work. Like they're looking at European players that have had careers and trying to do the same thing to North America, but expecting it to elevate the roster to a certain degree. Um, so it is it is scary to think that the, the the places that seem to have the most investment, I think the North American market is far larger than their successes would have indicate. Um, they just simply don't look for good investments on the side of, yeah, there there are emerging markets out there that you can potentially capitalize on. I think the main issue is that how marketable are your sponsors in those regions it is going to be a conversation that comes up in these boardrooms. Because if you did invest in like an IHC, are all of the EG sponsors going to be applicable to, to that market? Or do those, do those brands even have a chance or have any sort of presence or any or even a slight alternative to their products in that region it doesn't sometimes it doesn't make sense from that perspective but you don't have to take whole rosters you can just scout for talent yeah. which is yeah just the saddest part about it Wait, which is always like the pushback against the sponsorship argument right which is like okay don't pick up five players pick up one yeah try one you you've got a cat there's so many academy projects though just, just try one the the annoying thing for the academy projects is that with everything that's happened in Ukraine and you don't expect the We Play Academy League to come back anytime soon. And so those those academy teams can still exist. You know, they're like you said, you're playing in like tournaments outside of the partner divisions or where your teams would compete. You know, that's probably what Evil Geniuses should be doing as well, because they've got three rosters that also can't compete even regionally for their qualifiers, unless they're playing at Nerd Street, which may no longer exist. Um there there are so many chances for you to to take and two rosters is probably the, the limit you can sort of bar for yourself unless you've got some someone that can actually tutor and properly teach these guys how to play because there are so f few um there are so few experienced heads that are willing to take up a role like that and and i guess serve as academia of counter-strike that it's it's almost impossible to set something like that up unless you pay a large sum of money to set up some kind of like internal scholarship program, which is which would just be strange, you know. Where I'm, I'm starting to go down the rabbit hole of like things you could alternatively do instead of the the obvious things, which is just take a chance. Yep. I, I and just to sort of add to that, I just checked ten out of the thirteen Louvre Agreement teams are English speaking, right? The Louvre Agreement teams are the best teams to have an academy project that you could possibly want. And that's not even like all of the necessarily teams, right? Like I think OG, I don't know if OG's academy project is still active or not, but you know, OG had an academy project for a while. Spirit had an academy project for a while. And obviously, you know, not all of these are English speaking necessarily. But the point is that if a lot of the other thing is a lot of these teams already have facilities, right? So they have yeah. facilities in Serbia or like in like these comparative lower cost non engine areas and whatnot. It's not that much more expensive to just facilitate these players coming over and playing on online tournaments. They don't have to travel. They don't have to go to lands, right? So just build something up in that vein, which will save you a whole lot of money uh, if you're doing it right and you're you know just hiring maybe like one competent person, which is hard to come across sometimes. Uh, but just hiring one competent person for uh, the job. But unfortunately, like I said, hard to come across. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of people will fall into the trap of they don't watch as much Asian Counter-Strike maybe as you do and that they actually just have no idea where to start. Like, I think you, take, you can point to four, five, six players who you think you could put on these teams, but do could these teams point to these players? I'm not sure. Um, Half of them can't even be asked to, like, anti-strat teams in tournaments they're in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will give this piece of advice. You can go to my Twitter, you can see my email address, it's pinned right there, drop me an email, and uh, let me berate you evil geniuses for a while, and then I'll tell you the place. <laughs> right, so that's that's the the precondition, is like, if we're going to talk, let me get my peace out first. I, I mean, listen, I'm going to berate you for not coming sooner. But listen, but, but, but in all seriousness, there are people who watch, there are people who participate, perhaps more than that, and if you can't go to like a caster because you're like, oh my God, he's a caster. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, you know, you're sure that that's perfectly valid because most casters don't know what they're talking about, especially when it comes to the Asian region. Uh, this has been like a problem I've had for a very long time. 
Uh, but go to like former players. Go to players who have had international appearances. Go to like your Urkost. Go to like your impression. Uh, yeah, yeah, like impressions, the obvious one. Like, you know, you have like a lot of sad my clothes. I was know. just gonna say, like, that was the most obvious one because he actually tried to like interconnect all the Asian teams. Like, he just yeah. set up like a Discord and tried to get all team captains to like talk about the issues of the region and things like that. Like, yeah. impressions, like the perfect guy to talk you know, to. Impression, Urkast, you know, probably some someone maybe from Misa or whatever. Like, there there are people out there who you can at least initiate contact with and start building things up. And these guys aren't necessarily going to be great from the start, but at the very least, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, because oh, the yeah, CIS absolutely. is going to dry out because you can't like you know because of the world circle you can't just you can't get Russian players these days. Israel is going to dry out pretty soon as well because it's a small ass country. You're not going to have like you know twenty more talents coming out of it. You guys have already given up on Jordan because of visa issues because <laughs> like poor yeah. Boris can't get a team. Yeah, and a lot of those people from the Israeli region actually kind of started around the same time. Like it was like 2017, 2018, yeah. and it took them several years to develop this sort of I guess impression on the European stage that they're worth it to to a certain degree. Do you think if one team took a gamble and it worked, the floodgates would open? Or do you think it would be seen as, like, extremely lucky? Depends on who's doing it. Because if it's someone like Amaz, the floodgates won't open. Because, like, no one's gone after another, like, Australian player. Also, because... I have my opinions on Dexter. Uh, but... Uh... Like, like he's all right, but he's clearly not going to be able to lead them forward. Maybe picking up an IGL isn't your best bet. But yeah, so it depends on which team it is and how successful they're getting and how good that individual player is. If you're going for an IGL, you're you're probably not going to see anything more. Like, uh, people will not follow through. But if you get like a good star player, yeah, maybe. Who knows? Yeah, I think if you picked up Jam Young maybe a couple of years ago, it'd be worth it. If you picked up Mercury literally right now. It would yeah, be worth it. I could also, yeah, I mean, if if you could find a way for Mercury to to coexist with your roster, yeah. Uh, what does that mean? I mean, just just from a language, language barrier. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I thought yeah. that was uh, something. Uh, it's spicy. a very was convoluted just... way for me to say no, that. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's kind of on it's me. Just something. I, well, there's lots of things I don't know. I've I've seen him play probably <laughs> three times. Hey, he's he's I, I, I seem to remember. Yeah, yeah, I seem to remember both him and Mosia were very talented, but Mosia really went missing. In what, like in one of the one big game I saw, and I was like, I'm not sure if this is like he like really shat the bed, like four, I think like five six kills or something. Or something. I think that in six to nine months, Mercury is gonna be the best player in Asia. Mm-hmm. That's a spicy take. I think I don't know, man. Blitz it is, sounds spicy. Blitz, to me. Blitz exists. So. I know Blitz exists, but I just think individual, uh, not including like the IGL element. I think uh, Mercury is gonna be the best player in Asia. I like that. Okay. I don't um, I have no basis to fight him on it, so... <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not sure I have anything else to ask. Um, is there anything else you wanted to talk about um, in the last week? Um, anything else you want to talk about in regards to... Literally anything we spoke about today. This is okay. a, it's not I'm going to tell you all how to fix the problem for the Asian region, right? And... And as a bonus, I'll throw this in, and you know you're free to clip this one, AZ, and send it back to ESL and let them know that yeah, this was your idea. I'm okay with it. I'll let you take the credit. But and I'll uh, and I'll add in for free a solution to Australia and America as well. We do right? need a solution to America. I agree. <laughs> hey, I'm from Pakistan. You're preaching to the choir. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> No, I don't but... think we're clean on that. <laughs> hey, hey, I didn't call you out yet, but it's okay. Uh, there isn't any solution for British esports. It's all right. Uh, you guys are next to Europe and you still can't manage to compete. I don't know what the fuck is going on there. Um, uh, next to, not inside. Uh, just make the AAA League, Australia, Asia, and America, get like an actual Counter Strike League going on across these three, three continents, let them play against each other, let them develop storylines, let them develop narratives, which no one will give a fuck about domestically because there's no reason to watch an American team match fix against another American team. Right? <laughs> like, like, there isn't. Similarly, Australia, similarly, Asia, right? problems are there. Make them play against each other, 
sure, it's hard to align sponsors, yada, 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 all that good stuff. But the problem, but the point still is that as long as there is in domestic interest towards a particular point and you're hosting it in a low cost country in Asia, rather than, you know, going to Los Angeles, like for some reason, like half of the esports productions in the world, which I still don't understand what the fuck is going on there. Um, prioritize cost saving and run these leagues, run tournaments where it lets, where it isn't just, oh, look, uh, Asian team made it to Europe. Or, you know, the American plucky underdog made it to Europe. Watch them go up against Astralis in their prime because they're the last seed of the tournament and they will get literally nothing out of this entire experience in terms of international exposure. We do seeding that makes it so these teams are set up to fail. These teams need to be able to compete against each other. Hellman, I'd see just beat Furia. I'd see would have beaten Liquid on a map and who knows what happens if it goes to three over there. It wouldn't be as non-competitive as you think. There would be a lot more interest than you give it credit for. And if you want, you can mix in some, you know, European teams that aren't top five as well. I genuinely think that's got sponsor in, interest aligned with it. I think there's, you know, a lot you can do with you know, how mad we are in the Middle East already. Uh, you want to get like governments involved. You want to get government funding involved. I think there's a lot you can do for trying to get set up like hubs inside those areas as well for it. Let's try and go in that direction. Let's try and actually start being creative rather than just being like, oh, we can't fix Asia because Valorant has a hold of our Asia. Oh, we can't fix NA because Valorant has a hold of NA. Uh, we can't fix Australia because it, it, it's Australia. Um, so, right, so, so let's try and be creative about our solutions is sort of more my point. I also, think um, it's a good idea. I, I'm wondering the time zone, if, if you put it in Asia, the time zone is probably going to be unfavorable for American viewers who I would imagine are going to be the maybe they're not the main viewers really but you'd probably want some American viewers. I think they probably are. If, if, if it's going to be broadcast in English you know just that would have to be another conversation about how you broadcast it properly because you have so many sub-regions. Most of them if you're doing Americas and Australia would be English speaking and you know a lot of the regions in Asia are English speaking and English following as well um, but it would be yeah, it would be a tough sell. I think the Americans would probably have a more vested interest because it seems to be a bit more like, oh, well, it's Older America. Mexico. Uh, you would I mean, in Mexico. Yeah, could do. There you go. Do one season in Mexico, do one season in Asia. Two seasons yeah, a year, you're good to go. But you're go talking go. long-term living in Mexico for Australian and Asian. I, I, I quite literally just mean like two or three weeks long league. I genuinely think like, an actual league for just three weeks or like a small tournament or something where it's like a proper LAN environment where there's enough time to make some content around these teams where there's enough time to try and pair up narratives and there's some actual opportunities to level up. I really think that this is the kind of stuff that could drive domestic interest to such a large extent that people in Asia who won't watch Asian Counter-Strike will start watching because this is the one thing everyone forgets, which is that Hey, there's a lot of people in Asia who watch European CS. There's a lot of people in America who want to watch European CS. So, because CS is so European that there isn't really that much draw towards your domestic teams if you're only going to see, you know, like if you're Mongolian, if you're only going to see like IHC three times a year, just go out, get their, you know, get their shit kicked in, in like three series most of the times. And sure, this is like a really cool Cinderella run and whatnot, but most of the time you're just going to lose up to like a couple of matches and you're going to lose the tournament. Instead, you've got like real storylines, a real something to look forward to, something you can actually win inside, you know, something you could actually get like top two, top three in. And what, I think there's a lot, there is a lot to be made of it personally, if, if you can do something like it. And domestic scenes do try once there's that top down interest, because the other point is that just to sort of carry on a little bit more, I actually think Asia being so divided as far as regions and languages and some concerns is good because a lot of the times those small languages will be able to monetize their streams much more effectively because, hey, if people in Mongolia don't speak English, they're going to watch the Mesa stream for it. If Mesa has bought rights, they can get like exclusive domestic sponsors for that and whatnot. In Pakistan, I can tell you right now, uh, this isn't sponsored, right? Like in any way, is he just, just making sure? No, no. You right. Okay. You so, so for example, in Pakistan, I can tell you right now, because like these departments are really small, brands like Pepsi and whatnot, you can get them interested really easily. Like they might not immediately bite, but for example, like Pepsi 
would 100% be down with covering like a domestic coverage hub in ways that they would never be doing so in like an international regional sponsorship bracket. So the kind of dollars that you're able to bring in and the kind of like small media deals that you're able to bring in are very, very different when, hey, a lot of your audience is going to be Asian. Uh, the way that you can't really say the same for a lot of these you know, European products and like a lot of the international products in the same way, for example. I, I tried to set up a league once point time. Chinese broadcast rights go for pretty good amounts of money and whatnot. A lot of the costs can be covered as long as you're doing it in a low-cost country. A lot of the, the costs for some of these regions can even be covered by these like broadcast rights and like domestic sponsors and whatnot, things like it. There's a lot of commercial opportunity if you're able to uh, get the right people involved. Nice. Uh, I will push back. The only thing I'll bring up is that Forsaken did set back uh, potential regional growth once upon yeah. a time um, because there was a potential explosion uh, of, you know, I think investment. I think. Uh, but it is potentially overblown. Yeah. But at the same time, it's it's per certainly not done any favors in terms of investment into to the regions and trying to make your own type of hub. You know, maybe Optic India could have succeeded if not for that. The biggest scandal of all. I sports really doubt it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's all i got <laughs> wonderful um huge thank you both of you for joining i do i really like the idea of the triple a league it's uh see it's good great it's, branding it's, as well it's yeah it's i don't know it's it's, it's quite romantic i quite like it and yeah, it's a small battery be, it would just be quite amusing to watch like the american yeah. teams taken down a peg yeah i yeah. really think it would um yeah, no, I, I I do like that idea. Um, so big thank you to both of you for joining because there's no way uh, Logan and I would have been able to give anywhere near as much insight as as uh, you two when it comes to these teams and IHC. Um, yeah, uh, thank you both. Uh, thank everyone for watching, listening in the background, whatever, however you uh, choose to listen. Uh, thank you very much. Follow uh, with RetailDR on Twitter. I'm at AZESC. Uh, and you two are uh, at Yumi TV. That's Yumi with an M three. Just letting yeah. everyone Thank, know yeah, for I mean, him. Yeah, it's yeah, Y O U. Bro, I had M3 to three TV. Right. So again, it's M three. Right. Because he had to make it. And yeah, my branding sucks. I get it. <laughs> it's okay. At least you're not called uh, Inferno After Hours, which might just be the worst SEO you could ever get. CSGO Inferno After Hours. Hmm, I wonder what's going to show up. But hey, uh, that's a separate story. Uh, I uh, you, can, you can find me on Twitter at G-G-T-E-A time. So T time, but I have to spell T-E-A just in case. So you guys think it's with a three as well. Uh, but yeah, that's me. <laughs> or just a T time well, as well. Yeah. Could yeah. Could have been written like that. Sure. Sure. There you are. <laughs> All right, yeah, go follow those two, go follow us on Twitter, and we'll see you again next week.